All right, Ms. Heidemann, now that you've been sworn, let me just inquire, have you reviewed any of the trial testimony in this case since it started? I have not. Okay, you haven't watched any of the coverage of the case or reviewed online or on news or anything, any of the prior testimony? No, sir. Okay, thank you for that response. As we get started then, please make verbal responses to all questions and try to avoid talking at the same time as any lawyer asking you a question so we can keep our record clear. With that in mind then, Ms. Blake, you can inquire on direct. Thank you, Your Honor. Will you please state your name and spell your last name for the record? Nicole Heidemann, H-E-I-D-E-M-A-N. Where are you currently employed? The Federal Bureau of Investigation. How long have you been employed with them? Almost 15 years. What is your current title or position? I am a tactical specialist. Have you held other positions within the FBI? I have. And what are those? I was an evidence technician prior to my current position. Yeah. Yeah, sure thing. At some point, did you become involved in an investigation regarding some missing children? I did. And who are those missing children? J.J. Vallo and Tylee Ryan. As part of your job duties, were you given specific assignments with regard to that investigation? I was. At some point, did that investigation broaden to include some other investigation to other conduct? Yes. And what other conduct? There was the investigation into the murder of Charles Vallo as well as Tammy Dayball and an attempted shooting or a shooting of Brendan Boudreau. As part of your job duties, were you asked to review some Google searches on chad.daybell at gmail.com? I was. Were you also asked to look into some Google searches conducted on lollytimeforever at gmail.com? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that defense, the witness, and the court all be handed a copy of State's Exhibit 184A. I will note we have not brought in 184 yet. That will come in later. With regard to this, this is a printout of another exhibit that's a PowerPoint, but it's a printout for the benefit of counsel, the court, and the witness. Okay. Thank you. And if you'll look those pages over. And do you recognize those? I do. And were those, in fact, created by you? Yes. And are they printouts from a PowerPoint that you created? Yes. Did you create that based on your investigation or what you reviewed in this case? It was. Does that, would that aid in your testimony today? Yes. And is that a summary of what you reviewed? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 184A. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. May I voir dire in aid of an objection? Yes. So these summaries of activities, this isn't a full summary, correct? No. Well, it's not all the searches, no. I mean, there's only eight searches on the Chad Daybell one and nine searches on the Lori Daybell one? Yeah, it's not all the activity, just a summary of relevant search findings. When you say a summary of relevant search findings, that's just a summary of the things that go towards your theory of the case, right? Towards what, yeah, law enforcement theory of the case. Okay. But there's a whole bunch of other searches that were done between January of 2019 and October of 2019, right? Yes, sir. Okay. We won't object for the purposes of what she's testifying to today, Judge. Okay. So Exhibit 184A is admitted. And, Your Honor, I would ask to be able to publish Exhibit 184A to the jury. You may publish it. Thank you, Your Honor. And it is going to be from the laptop. 
Okay. As I indicated, this is actually a PowerPoint. I have a jump drive that has been marked with States Exhibit 184A for admission to the court uh, after being published. Okay. And it, uh, well, to be clear, then 184A, it, there's a paper version of it. You've also got the jump drive. Correct. Are they both going to be labeled 184A? Yes, that's what we've been doing before. I think uh, what the court's indicated before is the jump drive will be the actual exhibit because it contains the PowerPoint, but for courtesy of the court and counsel, we did the printouts. Understood. So 184A is admitted, and you can publish the PowerPoint if you want. Okay. And Ms. Heideman, looking at this first slide, um, it indicates October 1st, 2018 through the end of production. Were there additional searches contained prior to October 1st, 2018? Yes. Why did you focus in on October 1st of 2018 forward? Our investigation revealed that uh, Chad Daybell and Lori Vello met in October of 2018, uh, specifically October 26, 2018. So uh, we chose just to go a little bit prior to that for investigative purposes. And I would ask again the witness, sorry, if you can just really talk right into the microphone. They're not all that sensitive, and that'll make right. sure it's on the record. So looking at the first search indicated there, will you read the date and the search into the record? January 28th, 2019, Ned Snyder, 1996, Duff, Louisiana, Ned Snyder, Louisiana, Ned Snyder, Louisiana, born 1951, died 1996 and bodies possessed after original occupant dies. And you were asked by defense counsel, there were additional searches on here, uh, correct? Oh yes, absolutely. Why did this particular search stick out? Uh, in the Chandler investigation, Chandler PD investigation, uh, Charles Vallow had made reference that he was being referred to as Ned Snyder or Schneider. Do you know where Charles was originally from? Uh, Louisiana, I believe. And then the next search on there, if you could read the date and that search into the record. January 31st, 2019, Ned Schneider, Louisiana, obituary, 1997. And did that one stick out for the same reasons? It did. And then the next one, if you could read the date and the search into the record. March 6th, 2019, June 26th, star sign, are cancer and Leo compatible, and May 4th, star sign, uh, Taurus and Leo compatible. What was it? Jack, that is not what what's said on there. She's reading into what the exhibit actually says. And Your Honor, I think I'm aware of what counsel is indicating. If I may just ask a clarifying question. Go ahead. Um, I think what counsel's referencing is on the uh, May 4 sign. May 4 sign? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, could you just read that part uh, starting with the May? Yeah, my apologies. May 4 sign. Taurus and Leo compatible. Counsel, does that take care of the objection? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Why did that specific search stick out? Uh, June 26th is uh, Lori Vallow's birthday. Uh, May 4th is Tammy Daybell's birthday. And uh, Chad Daybell's birthday is August 11th, making him a Leo. And then if you can read the date of the next search and the search into the record. May 5th, 2019. Malachite, eBay Malachite jewelry. And what was it about that search that stuck out? Uh, Malachite is a green stone that Chad and Lori ultimately purchased for their wedding bands. And the next one, if you could read the date and the search. June 1st, 2019, Hiplos. And what was it about that one that caught your attention? Hiplos was another name that we found in the investigation to refer to uh, Charles Vallow. And the next one, if you could read the date and the search. Uh, July 9th, 2019, when you surprise someone with accusations. What was it about that particular search that caught your attention? Uh, that search was two days prior to Charles Vallow's uh, murder. And the next one, if you could read the date and the search. September 8th, 2019, SSW wind. What is the definition of SSW direction? What about that stood out? Uh, that date is the day prior to, or the day of that we believe um, Tylee Ryan 
was murdered and uh, we believe she was buried on the property or burned and buried on the property on September 9th, 2019. So it would have been the day prior. And whose property? Chad Daybell's. Do you recall when you were looking at the search terms, did you notice if Chad Daybell generally or commonly searched wind direction? No, not, I don't believe he, other than this occurrence, I don't believe he did. And if you could read the date of the next one and the search term? October 8th, 2019, Rhode Island area code. What was it about that that stood out? Um, Chad Daybell, there's multiple phones involved in this investigation. Uh, one of them is a 401 area code, which is the, which is the uh, area code for Rhode Island. It also is the same date that that 401 phone number went active, was activated. And then looking at the next slide here, um, this is linked to the Lolly Time Forever at gmail.com account. This has specific dates listed on there, the March 7th, 2019 to December 14th, 2019. Why are, uh, is that indicative of the, the dates that these searches occurred? Why did we choose those dates? Yes. I believe that was the date of the search warrants. All right. I would have to double check that one. But those were the parameters of the dates that you were looking and retrieving this information. Is that correct? Correct. Um, looking at the first one, if you could read the date into the record and the search term. May 7th, 2019, Malachite. What caught your attention about that search? Uh, similarly to Chad's um, search, it was the same green stone that was ultimately uh, purchased for the wedding bands. And the next one, if you could read the date and then the search term. July 21st, 2019, Gerber Life Policy, Life Insurance for Children, the Grow Up Plan. What caught your attention about that search? Uh, at the time of this, that this, that we reviewed this and subsequently finding out that the children had died, we thought it was of interest that uh, Lori was searching for life insurance for children. And to be clear, were any life insurance policies ever discovered for the children? Not that I'm aware of. Could you read the date of the next one as well as the content into the record? July 26, 2019, Phoenix Pet Services, Craigslist, Cell Service Dog, Little Angel Service Dogs, Service Dogs for Sale, and Offer Up Phoenix. What about that caught your attention? Uh, JJ Vallow had a service dog. Um, and after Charles's death, they sold the dog. So it's uh, looking for how to sell or rehome a service dog. And JJ was still alive on July 26th of 2019, is that correct? That's correct. What about the next one? Could you read the date and the search term into the record? August 25th, 2019, wedding bands made of malachite. And I think you may have answered this already, but what about that caught your attention? Uh, again, Malachite is a recurring theme. Uh, on, on the initial May 7th Malachite search, Charles Vallow is still alive, and um, he's deceased at this point, but Tammy Daybell is still alive. And then if you could read the date of the next one and the content into the record? September 20th, 2019, Kennedy Elementary, Rexburg, Idaho, phone number and defined possessed. So it looks like there's two. I'm going to object again. She misstated what she said Devon possessed, and it was just possessed. That's, it's sustained. It was misread. Very good. You'll just correct it. Um, just looking at the second search there, could you read that into the record? Define possess. And look, it appears that there's two separate uh, terms there, two separate searches. What about the one regarding Kennedy Elementary caught your attention? That was the school J.J. Vallow attended in Rexburg, Idaho. And what about the second uh, search there caught your attention? Uh, for similar reasons, but this uh, search occurred just a day or two after we believed uh, J.J. died. And that's referring to the September 24th search? Correct. Um, looking at the September 20th, there's also the defined possess. Was there something about that that caught your attention? Uh, throughout the investigation, the concept of possession, D 
demons, uh, those sort of um, ideas came up pretty frequently. So in context within the same time frame as uh, the Kennedy Elementary School, we thought that was of interest. And the two dates there on the Kennedy Elementary School are September 20th and September 24th, correct? Correct. Do you know when the last time JJ was seen was? Uh, the last proof of life was se the morning of September 22nd, 2019. So right in between those two dates. Correct. And if you would look at the uh, next one on there, the one on September 30th, if you could read the date into the record and the search. September 30th, 2019. How to get the back seat out of my Jeep Wrangler. Jeep Wrangler JK rear seat removal. How to DIY YouTube. What stood out about that search? Uh, the date of the search, September 30th, was uh, just a few days before um, Brandon Boudreaux was shot in Arizona uh, from a Jeep Wrangler. And when you say shot, do you mean shot at? Shot at, I'm sorry, yes. And then uh, the next one on there, um, the October 2nd? October 2nd, 2019, Gilbert AZ News. And what stood out about that? That is the same day that Brandon Boudreaux was shot at. And the shooting would have occurred, did you know, do you know where the attempted shooting of Brandon occurred? In Arizona. And the last one on there? On October 22nd, 2019, wedding dresses, wedding dresses in Kauai. And what stood out about that? Uh, that date and the search for wedding dresses was approximately three days after Tammy, Davidel, Tammy Daybell's death and the same day as her funeral. As part of your duties with this investigation, were you asked to look at various um, phone data? Yes. And were you asked to review the contents of phones recovered pursuant to search warrants? Yes. Were there multiple uh, search warrants and devices that you reviewed the data from? Yes. Did you also review some interviews? I did. Did you discuss uh, the investigation with other um, either special agents, detectives, or other law enforcement officers? I did. As part of that, were you asked to determine which uh, to do uh, phone number attribution? Yes. And when we talk about a phone attribution or a phone number attribution, could you explain a little bit what that means? Yes. Uh, phone attribution is the process of attempting to identify the likely primary user of a phone or a phone number, um, typically through uh, reviewing documents, uh, search warrant returns, phone extractions, and you're finding a phone number in close proximity or context with another identifier, such as a name or an account or address, something along those lines. And ultimately, that allows you to identify who you would determine to be the primary user linked to that phone number. That's correct. Um, as in preparation for your testimony today, um, did you prepare an exhibit? I did. A PowerPoint exhibit specifically? Yes. Your Honor, I'm going to ask that defense counsel, the witness in the court, be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 186. I would indicate, again, there is a matching jump drive for this, which uh, these are the printout slides from that, uh, power, from that jump drive. Okay. And Ms. Heidemann, if you could look through those pages. Okay. Does that appear to be an accurate depiction of the PowerPoint you created? It does. And was that prepared by you today in aid of your testimony? Uh, yes. And do you believe that it would aid you in your testimony today? I do. Your Honor, I'd ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 186. Any objection? Your Honor, I've previously reviewed 186 over the weekend. I have no objection to this. 
All right. Exhibit 186 is admitted. And, Your Honor, I would ask permission to publish. You may publish the PowerPoint. And again, just for the record, does this appear to be the first slide in the PowerPoint you created? Yes. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Your Honor, I apologize. For some reason, it will not go into the slideshow format on mine. We're going to hook into a different laptop and see if that will correct it. All right. We're fine. Oh, no, not that one. And, Your Honor, in the meantime, um, if I can have the court handed State's Exhibit 184A, it's the jump drive that was previously admitted. All right. Thank you for your patience. I think we have it running on this one now. So looking at this, uh, this is the second page or the second slide. Um, there's three individuals listed here. Uh, why are these three individuals listed? Uh, we identified these three individuals as the primary sub subjects in this investigation. And are there specific dates that you were focused on? Again, back to the October 2018 time frame through January 2020. And the first individual on there listed is Chad Daybell. How many phone numbers did you ultimately attribute to him? Uh, approximately nine during this time frame. And of those nine, did you narrow that down? I did, two and three. Okay. And with Lori Vallow, how many phone numbers were attributed to her? Uh, approximately six. Did you also narrow that number down? I did. And how many was that narrowed to? Three. And same thing with Alex Cox. How many phone numbers were attributed to him? Uh, approximately six. And did you ultimately narrow that down? 
Yes. And when we talk about narrowing it down, uh, how did you determine for each of them that there were three phones that you focused in on or three numbers? Uh, for the purpose of this investigation, uh, there was a lot of information contained in text message content through the iClouds and also geolocation data. Um, they primarily focused on three numbers, um, actually for each of them during this relevant time frame. So to minimize some of the noise of all of the phone numbers that we identified, the ones being presented today are the ones that are going to be the most frequent, which you're going to hear from other people testifying if they haven't already um, coming forward. And if we focus in on the phones uh, or the phone numbers, excuse me, associated with Chad Daybell first, um, looking at that first one on here, can you read that number into the record? 208-690-9374. And on there, there are nine things listed. Um, are those the nine items that uh, assisted you in attributing this number to Chad? Yes. Were there other things that also would have assisted with the attribution? Yes. On these that you focused in on, can we go through those? Yes. Can we just read them? Yes. Okay. If you'll just kind of provide either reading them or providing why you focused in on those. Okay. Uh, again, just as an overall, um, I reviewed case files from all the agencies involved and um, in reading reports and interviews and cell phone extractions and legal process, I was looking for phone numbers to, uh, that were relevant and then finding places in which they appeared next to a name or account. So the documents that um, attributed this phone number to Chad was um, the subscriber information. It was subscribed to Tammy Dayball since March 17th, 2018. This number was listed on a Hawaii rental agreement effective December 15th, 2019 um, in Chad's name. It was saved as contact Chad in Tammy Daybell's cell phone, our phone. It's the SMS number associated with Chad Daybell at Gmail. It was listed on a Citibank application in Chad's name. It was listed on the Life Map insurance benefit claim form filled out by Chad Daybell for Tammy Daybell's uh, death. It was saved as contact Bishop Shumway in the Lori for Style iCloud. It was listed on Allegiant Flight Records associated with Chad Daybell. And it was saved as contact Dad in Seth Daybell's phone. And do you know Seth Daybell's relationship with Chad Daybell? Uh, it's his son. And Tammy Daybell was Chad's wife? Correct. And then we see here a Cricket account. Um, what was it about the Cricket account that caught your attention? Uh, one of the frequent, one of the numbers that appears pretty frequently in um, the iCloud accounts with communications to Lori uh, was a number that started with 505 or 515, which should be coming up. But we did, we, we sent legal process and found that there are actually four numbers on this account in addition to the one number. Um, well, two numbers of interest. So all four of them sort of help uh, create attribution for each other. And on this, you've uh, it lists a subscriber, um, Boyd Dial. Is that correct? Yes. Do you know if there was any investigation done to determine if a Boyd Dial actually existed? There was. And what did that consist of? Uh, I was able to identify two Boyd Dials in the United States, both of which lived in Utah and did not have any historical addresses in Arizona. Are you aware if any follow-up was done with those two individuals? Yes, uh, FBI agents interviewed both individuals and cleared them of any association with this case. And as you went through your investigation and looking at the um, different data and interviews, did you find anything to attribute any of the phone numbers on that Cricket account to either Boyd Dial? No. And looking uh, at this number, could you read that number into the record? 480-395-5126. And outside of being associated with the Cricket account, uh, was there something about this number that caught your attention? It was saved in the Lori for Style iCloud along with Chad's um, known number, the 280 number, as the same contact, Melanie 2. That sort of helps to attribute them to each other. And... Um, and that was the 208 number associated with him? 
Correct. The 208-690-9374 and 480-395-5126 were saved as a same contact, Melanie 2. And looking at the next number here, can you read that phone number into the record? 480-812-5496. What was it about this number uh, that caught your attention? Um, two things. One, uh, the activation date for the prior number, the 480-395-5126, uh, was active from October 31st, 2018 through January 31st, 2019. The secondary number that ends in 5496 is activated the day that the previous number um, was deactivated or expired and ran through July 1st, 2019. Additionally, it was also saved in the Lori for our Style iCloud account as Contact Genie. And these two numbers are in white. Were these two of the three numbers that you focused in on? Uh, not so much as far as what you'll hear in the investigation, but they do provide further attribution for, for the other relevant phone numbers. And this next number, if you could read the number into the record. 515-402-0143. And this one, again, has some more things listed than the last one. Uh, could we go through what it was about this phone number that drew your attention? It was first identified by the Chandler Police Department in Lori's uh, 480-692-9562 call detail records and saved as contact Bubby in the Lolly Time iCloud account. Uh, it was active. It picked up the activation from um, July 1st, 2019, the date that the prior number, the 5496 number, expired and was active until October 8th, 2019. Uh, in the call detail records for this number, we found a call to the Valley of the Sun Mortuary on July 11th, 2019, uh, in which uh, Chad Daybell calls and leaves a air has an interaction with the mortuary, which is re was recorded. There was a text message from Lori with the content reading CONF number 99NBQ4, which was an Allegiant Airlines flight in Chad's name. A text from Lori on August 11th, 2019, birthday kisses all over. And finally, it was saved as contact Rebecca Shumway in Lori for Style, I, the iCloud account. And... Looking back at that 208 number, um, it was also saved, that number was saved as a Bishop Shumway. Correct. So that was the second time we'd seen the Shumway name. Correct. And then looking at this next one, if you could read that number into the record. 401-569-8260. And on this one, there's several different uh, items listed as well. Can we go through those? Uh, this number was first identified as the first contact of Alex's 334 phone number. Uh, the activation period for this for the 401 number picks up from when the 515 was uh, deactivated or expired and ran through December 30th, 2019. Chad conducted a Google search, as previously mentioned, for Rhode Island area code on October 8th, 2019, the same date that this phone was uh, purchased. There is a text from Chad's known number, 208-690-9374, to Lori on October 9th, 2019, saying, I will call right now from a 401 number. Uh, this number is only in contact with Lori's 480-489-4652 and Alex's 334-744-4205 phone numbers. And it is saved as contact Bishop Miller in Lori for Style at iCloud. And through these different ways, you were able to attribute all of these phone numbers to Chad Daybell? Yes, either through um, content or uh, it's being attributed to somebody that, you know, in Lori's iCloud, there's knowledge of that, that these two people are connected. And looking back again at that first number, the 208 number, was that active for the duration of these other numbers being active? I believe it was. I don't, based on uh, the legal process, I don't know that we ever had a deactivation time. So it would have meant that Chad Daybell had uh, at least two active phones at the same time. Correct.
And in looking at this next slide, um, there's two more numbers listed here. What was it about these two numbers that drew your attention? Uh, well, these are necessarily, um, I mean, these, do, these numbers are relevant in the sense that they help further attribute Chad to additional numbers, but also Chad and Lori's aliases that are used throughout the investigation. And what are those aliases? Uh, Raphael and Lily uh, for Chad and Lori and James and Elena. And with both of these numbers, uh, looking at the first one there, can you read that number into the record? 602-290-7288. And what was it with this number that assisted with attributing that to Chad? Uh, between these two uh, bullet points, uh, Chad, the, the text from this number to the Daybell children, it was a group text on December 4th that began, Hi, this is Dad. And in conjunction, it saved in Zulema's phone as contact with Raphael. So those two together would help attribute that this is Chad's phone, and he's also known as Raphael to others. And the next phone number, if you could read that into the... Oh. has saved as contact Raphael in Zulema's phone. And with that next number, if you could read it into the record. 480-341-9585. And what, uh, how were you able to attribute that phone to Chad? Uh, based on subscriber records for the James Lozalina at iCloud.com, uh, this phone number was uh, was listed in, in the subscriber records. This uh there was also a text from this number to the Daybell children on December 14th, 2019. That begins, hi, this is Chad. And it was a number being used by Chad and Lori, according to Ian Palowski. And both of these numbers would have been in use later on in the investigation? Correct, after, uh, after the homicides, yes. And would this have been after uh, Chad and Lori had left the Idaho area? Uh, yes. Then looking at Lori and the cell phone numbers attributed to her, if you could read that first number into the record. 480-489-4652. And there are several things listed there uh, identifying this phone as being attributed to her. Did you find other things to also attribute this phone to her or this number? Uh, yes. Were these the main things that you had focused in on? Yes. And if we could just go through those. It was identified by Chandler Police Department during a review of the Lori for Sile iCloud account. Um, there was no subscribe based on uh, the the provider records, there was actually no subscriber name uh, associated, but the account IDs were similar to Lori's known um, email accounts, which were Lolly Time at iCloud and Lori for Style at Hotmail. Additionally, the credit card information uh, associated with the provider information was, uh, was, was in Lori Bellow's name. Um, and this phone number was effective from January 31st, 2019 through December 28th, 2019. This number is also listed along with Lori Vallow's name on Allegiant flight records. It saved as contact Lori and Lily in Melanie Boudreau Pulowski's phones. It saved as contact Lori Vallow in Zulema's phone along with an additional phone number 480-692-9562. It's listed on Delta flight records along with KK Walker 75 at yahoo.com. And it was a contact number on a Hawaii wedding quote request. And looking in uh, at the Delta flight records associated with KK Walker 75 at Yahoo, what was it about that uh, that drew your attention? We had identified two emails sent from this email to uh, Chad Daybell that Charles Vallow had uh, have found in the iCloud accounts and confronted Chad and Lori about being a false representation of uh, wishes he was making to have somebody write a book for him and asking for Chad to travel to, uh, I believe it was Houston, uh, for a children's camp. 
And looking at this next phone number, if you could read that number into the record. 480-692-9562. And again, there are several things listed here. Were there other things that attributed this phone number to Lori? There were. Were these the things that you'd focused in on the most? Yes. And if we could go through what those are. 480, oh, I'm sorry. Um, the first one was Taylor Police Department's review of Charles Vallow's cell phone uh, reviewed this as another number for Lori. So Charles had this saved in his phone. Uh, it was subscribed to Lori Vallow, effective February 4th, 2019 through January 5th, 2020. Uh, based on legal process, we found that this number was associated with the lolly time at iCloud, Lori for style at iCloud, and lolly time forever at gmail.com accounts. It was listed as the Amazon shipping contact for Charles Vallow at 565 Pioneer Road, apartment 175 in Rexburg, Idaho. It was the contact number provided on PO Box 415 Sugar City, Idaho application along with Lori Vallow's name. It was saved as contact Lily and Lolo and Melanie Boudreau Pulowski's phone. And uh, similarly to the prior number, it was listed as a contact number on the Hawaii wedding quote request. And looking at that Amazon shipping, the 565 Pioneer Road, is that an address that was ever associated to Char with Charles Vallow that you're aware of? No, it was not. Was it an address that it's that he ever lived at, if you're aware? Uh, no, it was not. Is that an address that was associated with Lori Vallow? Yes. And did she live there? Yes. And looking at the next one. Could you read that number into the record? 808-755-5452. And similarly, there's several things listed there. Were there other ways in which this number was attributed to Lori? Yes. Were these the main ones that you focused in on? Yes. And if you could indicate what those are. Uh, Lori provided this number to Chandler Police Department during their investigation into the death of Charles Vallow. It was subscribed to Premier Financial Services effective January 8th, 2016 and until November 24th, 2019. It was associated with the Lori for Style iCloud account. There was an IM to a Peter Dickinson on August 8th, 2019 that stated, Hi, Peter, this is Lori Vallow. It was saved as contact Lolo Vallow in Melanie Boudreau Pulowski's phone. It was saved as contact to Lily in Melanie Boudreau Pulaski's phone, and similarly to the other two number, it was other two numbers. It was listed as a contact on the Hawaii wedding quote request. And on those Hawaii wedding quote requests, do you know was that filled out in conjunction with Chad and Lori's uh, request to get married? Yes. And then. Looking at the Premier Financial Services, what was it about that that drew your attention? That was Charles Vallow's business. I think it misstates the actual evidence. I'll sustain that objection. As to that, just the final part of that last response. As to the final part of the response there, the objection is sustained. Do you know what, uh, do you know if Charles Vallow was associated with a business while he was alive? Yes. And what business was that? Premier Financial Services. Then looking at the next slide, if you would read, uh, these are the numbers associated with Alex Cox. Correct. And if you could read that first number into the record. 480-351-9120. And there are six different things listed there. Were there other ways in which this number was attributed to Alex? Yes. And were these the main ones that you focused in on? Yes. If you could please go through those. Uh, again, this was the contact number provided by Alex to Chandler Police Department and during the investigation into the Charles, Val Charles Vallow homicide. It was actually subscribed to Alex Cox um, with an effective date of February 27th, uh, 2015 until an unknown date uh, based on the legal process only went up to a certain date, so I'm not sure where, when it ended exactly. 
It was associated with email accounts homerjmaximus at gmail.com and homerjmaximus at yahoo.com. It was saved as contact Alex Cox in the Lolly Time at iCloud.com account and as Alex Cox in the Lori for Style iCloud, iCloud.com account. And it was listed on Allegiant Flight Records, which also included Homer J. Maximus at Yahoo.com. And looking at this next phone number, if you could read that into the record. 304-960-5998. And there are not as many things listed on this one. Were there other ways in which you attributed this phone to Alex Cox? Uh, there was not much on this phone. There are other ways but uh, through location services, but I cannot testify to that. So based on what you could review, uh, if you could go through what led you to attribute this phone to Alex Cox? It was identified through the phone's IMEI as being associated with the Homer J. Maximus at gmail.com uh, subscriber records or access records. Uh, there was no subscriber name associated with this number, uh, but there was an account ID uh, of raymaximus at gmail.com, and it was effective from September 27th, 2019 through December 28th, 2019. And on this next one, if you could read the number into the record. 334-744-4205. Were there other ways in which, outside of what's listed here, were there other ways in which this number was attributed to Alex Cox? Uh, yes. Uh, were these the main ones that you focused in on? That I focused in on, yes. And if you could indicate what those are. It was, this phone number was associated with a Samsung Galaxy phone recovered from Alex's Rexburg apartment. Uh, there, again, there was no subscriber name, um, as indicated by the provider. However, there was an account ID of raylamar at gmail.com. It was effective from October 9th, 2019 through January 9th, 2020. And it was saved as contact Spencer's wife in the Lori for Style at iCloud.com account. And again, when you're attributing a phone number to someone, what does that mean? Uh, phone numbers or phones and phone numbers can be used by multiple people, but we are trying to figure out to identify, especially when there is no subscriber information, who the likely primary user is. Um, obviously, phones can be passed around. So trying to figure out who the likely primary user is um, gives a pretty indication, pretty good indication of um, who's making these, who's uh, making the calls and text messages primarily. And, Your Honor, I would indicate there are a couple other exhibits that I intend to try to introduce with this witness. I can move forward, or I didn't know if the court would like to break at this point before we get into the next uh, exhibits. If you think this is a good logical time to break, we could probably take our lunch break at this point. The next exhibit, I think, will take more than 10 minutes uh, to go through, uh, assuming it's admitted. And so given that, I wondered if now would make sense to break. Okay. I think we can do that. That makes sense as well. Um, so we will take the lunch recess. We'll try to get started uh, before... One o'clock, obviously, maybe um, 12.45 to restart with more testimony, if that'll give everyone time to get lunch. All right. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. We're ready to have the jurors brought in whenever they're ready.
Oh. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, that concludes the lunch break. The court would note the jurors are all present and accounted for. Uh, the state is conducting direct examination of uh, FBI agent Heideman. Ms. Blake, if you'd like to continue with your direct at this time, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Ms. Heideman, as part of your responsibilities, were you also asked to look specifically for evidence of wedding planning? Yes, I was. And again, did you review phone data? Yes. Did you review data recovered from search warrants? I did. And responsive documents? Yes. Did you discuss the case with other investigators? Yes. Uh, both uh, special agents and detectives? Yes. Did you also read uh, reports of interviews? I did. And in preparation of your testimony today, did you create a PowerPoint exhibit? I did. And Your Honor, I'm going to ask that both the witness, the court, and the witness be handled, handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 185. Similar to the other ones, these are pages that are part of a PowerPoint, uh, but for courtesy of the court, counsel, and the witness, we printed out the pages associated with that PowerPoint. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. And if you would look through those pages you've been handed. Okay. Do those appear to be an accurate representation of the PowerPoint you created? They are. And did you, do those contain information that you learned through you're part of this investigation? Yes. Would that aid in the presentation of your testimony today? It would. And is this a summary of various documents and information you obtained? Yes. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of this exhibit. Any objection from the defense? Yes, Your Honor. We believe <clears throat> that uh, pages two and three of this exhibit are uh, irrelevant and 
have nothing to do with this case. We believe that page 4 contains 404B evidence. We believe that Those are all the objections that we have. All right, let's take those individually then. There's first an objection lodged on relevance grounds for pages two and three. Would you like to address that, Ms. Blake? Yes, Your Honor. And if I may ask some questions of the witness in aid of that. And before publishing them, but if you'd make reference also to make sure we're tracking the same page, all of us, meaning me, you, and defense counsel, because there aren't page numbers. And the one that I'm looking at would be the one without getting into what the slide contains too much would be the two documents. Okay. Is that the one counsel's referencing with regards to page two? Yes. All right. Ms. Heidemann, did you review documents recovered from the Lori First Style at iCloud.com? I did. Were there some documents that were recovered in addition to messages and other information? Yes. And looking at page two without describing what's on it, is that one of the documents that was recovered from the Lori First Style at iCloud.com review? It was. And then similarly with page three, was that document also recovered from the Lori First Style at iCloud? It was. And it was? Yes. Your Honor, I think given the fact that these were discovered in the Lori First Style at iCloud, which has already been submitted to the court, that account, and the documents retrieved from that and the information, I believe they're already in evidence. So with that, I'd ask to be able to admit it because they've already been admitted, and I think we could get to the relevance argument when we start to discuss that, unless the court wants me to go into more detail now. I think we need to determine before it's admitted whether or not the relevance objection would be sustained. So now that I've looked at it and reviewed it, Mr. Thomas, do you have any further objection as to the relevance on those first two pages? Yes, Your Honor. I don't know who, if these were to Lori Vallow or from Lori Vallow, and I think it would be significant to know that. And I'm, again, objecting to the relevancy. I don't think it has anything to do, I don't think, well, I'm just going to, yeah. The question I have looking at them, Ms. Blake, on pages two and three, I think given the theory of the case of the state, there is relevance here and would overrule an objection just based on relevance looking at the content. The question I would have then is whether this is, what is the source of this information? I mean, I don't know that this is actually information that was obtained and gathered by the investigator here directly from an account of the defendant or a co-conspirator alleged, or whether or not this was actually the information that was located in this account, the iCloud account. I don't know if I made that clear or not. If I can ask some additional questions, I may be able to clear that up. So a foundational concern is what I have. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. With regard to those two documents, I believe you already indicated they were located in the Lori Freestyle at iCloud.com, the responsive documents for that account? Correct. Were you able to tell where they were located if they were sent to Ms. Vallow or if she sent them out? If I recall, they were just saved as documents in the account without any identifiers. But they were saved in the account of Lori Freestyle at iCloud.com? Correct. And, Your Honor, again, I think with that, the Lori Freestyle at iCloud.com, those responsive documents and the data has already been admitted into evidence. So these are already in evidence. Okay. And with that explanation also, I just was concerned about foundation, whether this was information that was extrinsically brought in through the investigator or whether it was actually in that account. So I'll overrule the objection as to relevance, and that satisfies my foundational concerns. So pages two and three, the objection is overruled. 
So then there was a, another objection on page. I believe it's page four. And just to be clear, is that regarding the Google searches? So that we're looking at the same page? There was a 404B objection. Would you? I think that was on page up? five. Oh, on page oh, five. Oh, was it page five? Okay. I was looking at page four. All right, the court's reviewed the objection as it relates to page five and references Arizona. The court would note that uh, previously I've made a determination that 404B evidence would be allowed in this case based on a ruling made in February. The jury will be further instructed on the issue of how to consider that evidence at the time of deliberations. So for that uh, reason, the objection as to the 404B lodged as to page 5 is overruled and that page can also be uh, admitted as part of the exhibit. Thank you, Your Honor. And Your Honor, um, Exhibit 185 is admitted then? So with that, yes, then Exhibit 185 is admitted. And I would uh, request permission to publish the PowerPoint presentation. Again, I have a jump drive that has been marked States Exhibit 185 that will be submitted to the court. Okay, so the exhibit will actually be the PowerPoint file that's located on that jump drive. The court has a courtesy copy, and with that, you can publish from the PowerPoint, Ms. Blake. Ms. Heideman, if we look at this slide here, uh, can you explain um, or can you tell me what two documents were located in the Lori for Styla iCloud that drew your attention? Uh, two documents, one titled Seven Archangels and the second one Presiding Council of Archangels. And in looking at this first document, the Seven Archangels, what was it about this document that drew your attention? Uh, initially, what drew my attention are the references to Raphael and James, or James the Just, uh, which we saw Chad refer to himself frequently by those aliases. And was there anything else that caught your attention? Um, to the presence of the day Tuesday, as well as a crystal affinity of Malachite. And we've talked a little bit about Malachite before. What was it about Tuesday that drew your attention? Uh, Tuesday in relation to Raphael and James or Chad um, stood out because Chad and Lori ended up getting married on a Tuesday. And if we turn to that second document, um, the presiding council of Archangels, what was it about that document that stood out? Uh, it, it contained very similar names, James and Raphael, along with uh, new names, Elena and Lily and then the combination of both together. And what was the significance of Elena and Lily? Those names appeared uh, in context with Lori and text messages and uh, I believe emails in the iCloud account. And then when we look at the Raphael and Lily together, what did you notice? Similarities with the date of Tuesday and the color of green. And looking at this uh, next slide, and we had previously talked about some Google searches for Malachite, correct? Yes. And those began, when did you locate the first searches for Malachite? Uh, I believe Chad's first search for Malachite was in March of 2018, and then not again until May of 2019 when it appears in Chad and Lori's Google search history. And in the Google searches that are up right now, do you know who had Googled those? Uh, well, they appear in the chad.dable at gmail.com search history. So they were Googled from that account at least? Correct. And what about this uh, next one that appears? That appeared in the lolly time forever at gmail.com search history. And what date was that searched? Uh, that would have been, I'm trying to... May 7th, 2019. And it has a timestamp there. Do you know what time that is in? Uh, that's an UTC time. So it may need to be adjusted depending on the location of the user? Correct. Uh, did you discover attempts to purchase some wedding rings? I did. 
And when was the first attempt that you located? The first attempt I located was on August 14th of 2019, in which Lori purchased two glow-in-the-dark malachite inlay titanium rings from an Etsy site and provided a shipping address to 5531 South Four Peaks Place in Chandler, Arizona. And that address that appears in there, that 5531 South Four Peaks Place, do you know who that address was associated with? With Lori Vallow. And before we talked about some searches done in May of 2019, do you know, was Charles Vallow alive at that time? For the searches, yes. And was he and was Tammy Daybell alive in May of 2019? Yes. And then on this August 14th date, do you know if Charles Vallow was still alive? He was not. What about Tammy Daybell? She was. And we talked about the UTC time zone. Do you know uh, where that time zone would be? Uh, it's kind of a, just a standard, like a zero time frame. And then it's adjusted depending on your location to the different time zones? Correct, yes. And then did you find another attempt to purchase wedding rings? Uh, yes. And when was that? On August 25th, 2019, uh, Lori attempted to purchase two custom titanium rings with malachite stone inlays in size 4.25 and 11.5 from Revolution Jewelry Designs with an express insured shipping to 565 Pioneer Road, apartment 175 in Rexburg, Idaho. And did that transaction go through? Uh, no, that, that transaction, uh, the card was declined and the order was canceled. And when we talk about that 565 Pioneer Road, number 175, do you know who that address was associated with? With Lori Vallow. Did you learn whether or not uh, there was ever a successful purchase of wedding rings? There were. And do you know when that was? On October 2nd, 2019. And um, on this, we see a purchase for two different rings. Did you focus in on one of these rings? Oh, we did on the second ring purchase. And why did you end up focusing in on that one? Uh, when we put the description of that ring into Amazon, that was the image that appeared, which also appears in their wedding photos. It's, it's, the ring is similar in style to the, their wedding photos. And when you talk about similar in style to the wedding photos, specifically, uh, was it Chad or Lori that the ring appeared to match? Lori's. And do you know what Amazon account this was purchased through? Uh, Charles Vallow's. Was Charles Vallow still alive on October 2nd of 2019? He was not. Was there another ring purchased that day? Uh, yes, there was. And do you know where that was purchased from? Uh, that was purchased through Roy Rose Jewelry, on on the uh, again through the Charles Vallow's Amazon account. And what did this appear to be a man or a woman's ring? Uh, based on the size, uh, it was more than likely a man's ring. And what size was ordered initially? Eleven point five. Did you notice another transaction in regard to that ring? Uh, yes, that initial ring was returned and eventually repurchased as a size 11. Do you know approximately when that occurred? On October 4th, 2019. Do you know the date that Tammy Daybell was pronounced dead? Uh, she was pronounced dead on October 19th, 2019. Was there an additional transaction with regard to that ring that occurred after Tammy was dead? Yes, the size 11 ring was returned again and repurchased as a size 10, uh, but that one what we believe was kept. There was no, you located no evidence that that size 10 was returned? Correct. Did you notice anything else about this specific ring? Uh, I'm not sure what you asked. When looking at the photo on Amazon, did oh, you notice that? anything with regard to that? Uh, yes, uh, similarly to the prior ring, when we uh, input the 
Thor Thorsten Mahai Malachite stone inlay into Amazon. The image that resulted is the image purchased there, which again appeared to be similar to Chad's ring in their wedding photos. And is this the wedding photo that you were referencing? It is. And so when you looked at this photo, uh, you compared it to those rings to determine that they appeared similar? Correct. Did you also look at some uh, a text message that had been sent? I did. And uh, looking at the slide, is that one of the text messages that you'd focused in on? Yes. And I say text, but it says SMS message. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, could you determine most likely who that message was sent from and to whom? Again, based on phone attribution, we believe the 515 Bobby number to be uh, attributed to Chad. And who would the message have been sent to most likely? Uh, it, this was in the Lori or the Lolly Time account, so to Lori Bellow. And what was the date of that message? Uh, July 13th, 2019. Did anything stick out to you about that date? This would have been two days after the death of Charles Bellow. And could you read into the record the content of that text or that SMS message? Yes. Concerning the two weeks, BYU-Idaho's graduation is July 23rd. Adam is getting his bachelor's, and Leah and Joe are getting their associates. They are all walking in the same commencement ceremony. I feel she will be gone by then, but I will still have the hoop, that hoopla to deal with because a lot of my and Adam's family are coming and will stay for July 24th. So I believe that's why the Lord hinted I might not get to be with you until that is over. Please ask about that. The individuals mentioned in that message, do you know who they are? Yes, Adam and Joe are Chad Daybell's son, sons-in-law, and Leah is his daughter. And there's some um, writing there at the bottom of the screen. Were those things that stood out to you about the text? Yes. Did you also review some texts between Chad and Lori um, from July 22nd of 2019? I did. And on this slide, uh, you have regarding Kwai and the plan. When you're referencing the plan, was this in relation to a specific plan? It appears to, with the totality of everything, to be the plan to uh, be in Hawaii together. And to ultimately be together? Correct. And in looking at that text exchange, could you indicate who the text originates from and to whom, or who we believe that it originates from and to whom, and the content of the message? Yes. Similarly to the prior text, uh, it, it, the iCloud shows that it originated, or it, in this situation, a to from situation from the 515 Bubby number uh, previously attributed to Chad to Lori. And what is the content of that first message? Love you, going with Garth in an hour to see other side of heaven too. Missing you desperately, but so excited to be with you. And is there a response from Lori? Yes, Lori responded, you will love it. And then the next message? Uh, the 515 Bubby number responds, not as much as I love you. And does Lori respond to that? She does. Uh, she says, I love you. You will enjoy the scenery. It looks like Kauai a lot. And is there another message then from Lori? Hopefully we will be there someday soon together. And what is uh, the number associated with Chad's response? That is the plan and my greatest desire. Did you then locate anything regarding... Um, Lori requesting a quote for a wedding. I did. And when was that quote requested? On October 30th, 2019. And where were they requesting to hold the wedding? Or was she? On uh, At the Kauai Beach in Hawaii. Did she specify a specific day in her request that they were wanting to get married? November 5th, 2019. Do you know if Chad and Lori were actually married? They were. 
And what day did they get married? Tuesday, November 5th, 2019. And do you know if they exchanged rings? They did. What type of rings did they exchange? Uh, they appear to be Malachite rings. And Judge, I have that uh, jump drive, States Exhibit 185. All right, we'll have that admitted into evidence. Your Honor, I also have what's been marked as States Exhibit 230. Uh, these are records, business records that contain a certification. I have a copy for counsel, uh, the court, and um, the witness, and a courtesy copy for Your Honor as well, if All we right, can show you. it to defense counsel. It's my understanding this was already stipulated to with having the business record certification. All right, we'll take a moment and review those. And Ms. Heidemann, it looks like you're looking through those, but if you can just review those as well. Your Honor, again, the state would move for those admissions, the admission of that exhibit based on stipulation. Any objection as to admitting exhibit 230? Well, I'm just going to object to <clears throat> the completeness of it. This is not uh, this is not a complete record of what was sent or that what was received in this in this uh, search warrant or subpoena. All right, response to that, Ms. Blake. Your Honor, if I may have just a moment. Yes. Judge, if we could maybe approach for a brief sidebar. Yes. All right, on the sidebar, Ms. Blake, I understand there are some additional records that would be included with this particular exhibit, and the state's going to retrieve those at this time. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. All right. Well, we talked about that. I think it would be efficient for us to uh, just keep, well, to, to do that at this time in lieu of trying to bring it back later at another point. So uh, for that reason, then, uh, the state indicates it's not going to take very long to do that, but it will take a few moments, so we'll take a brief recess at this time until those records have been located and provided, and then we'll come back on the record for additional direct. So we'll take a recess now for maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, please. Thank you. We'll have the jurors brought in. You can just remain standing.
All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record. Case CR 2221-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Ballow. We just took a recess to sort out a particular exhibit. Uh, it appears that the additional pages have been Submitted at this time. Ms. Blake, if you want to continue with offering that exhibit, you may. Thank you, Your Honor. And for the record, uh, counsel was right. There were some missing parts to that exhibit. Those have been located and attached at this point. I had them attached to both the court's courtesy copy, the official copy, as well as have attached one to the exhibit for the witness, and defense counsel has provided those additional pages. So with those additional pages being attached to that exhibit, we would move for the admission of State's Exhibit 230. Okay, any objection now to admission of Exhibit 230? No, Your Honor. All right, Exhibit 230 will be admitted. Ms. Heideman, did you have a chance to look at Exhibit 230? I did. Do you recognize that as some documents that you had been asked to review as part of your role in this investigation? Yes. In reviewing those, did you end up putting together a PowerPoint presentation regarding what you observed in those records? I did. And is it something that you believe would aid you today in your testimony? Yes. And, Your Honor, I have what's been marked as State's Exhibit 185A. I have a copy for counsel. Uh, the, I just made three copies, but counsel, the court, and then if the witness can be shown one. Yes. And, again, similar to the last exhibits, this is a printout of a PowerPoint presentation that is on a separate jump drive, also marked as State's Exhibit 185A. All right, thanks for that explanation. And is that, in fact, a copy of the PowerPoint that was prepared by you? It is. And is it a summary of the documents that you reviewed? It is. Your Honor, I would ask for the admission of State's Exhibit 185A. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, and uh, this particular objection, I think... Either we should do a sidebar or we should do it outside the presence of the jury. All right, let's uh, discuss with the sidebar first and see where we go from there. All right, after sidebar, we'll be back on the record. The court had a discussion with counsel about this objection. Mr. Thomas, uh, I've approved, if you, I think it would be appropriate if you want to indicate your concern with this particular exhibit and make your objection in the presence of the jury, you may do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, the objection that we have is that uh, the state is presum presuming that Tyler Ryan was killed on September the 8th or 9th and that J.J. Vallow was presumably killed on September 22nd or 23rd and that Tammy Daybell was killed on October 18th or 19th. Uh, we're objecting that uh, to the reference of them saying that they've been killed. We don't believe that it's appropriate to uh, have the jury assume uh, these things, that these things need to be proved out, and we don't believe that they've been proved out uh, as of yet. All right. And in lieu of uh, response at this time, I'll just note we did discuss this in a sidebar. The court considered that objection, and the way I'll rule on the objection is um, in terms of the admission of Exhibit 185A, I'll allow for it to be admitted, but clarifying that this is a demonstrative exhibit because certain uh, indications in the exhibit that may be stated as fact have yet to be or have not been conclusively potentially proved at this point. So I think it's uh, something that can be argued on both cross-examination and in your direct, Ms. Blake, but because of those dates there as they relate to the deaths, the court will admit that with a uh, limiting instruction that this would be a demonstrative exhibit and not evidence of those facts as it's existing on this on this uh, timeline. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. 
given that, the state would ask to publish Exhibit 185A. You may publish it. And with um, this, is this in fact the exhibit that you prepared? It is. Were you asked specifically to look at dates that Chad and Lori visited the temple together? Yes. And were you also asked to specifically look at dates they visited the temple together prior to being married? I was. In looking at this chart, were there specific dates that you located where they had in fact attended a temple together? Yes. And looking at those, can you indicate the dates that they attended temples together? Uh, November 16th of 2018, they attended the Gilbert Temple together. On April 3rd, 2019, they attended the Idaho Falls Temple together. On April 27th, 2019, they attended the Houston Temple together. On September 7th, 2019, they attended the Idaho Falls Temple together. On September 17th, 2019, uh, they attended the Rexburg Temple together, although that one had a more significant time difference than previous and, and subsequent visits. On September 28th, 2019, they attended the Rexburg Temple together, and on October 29th, 2019, they attended the Rexburg Temple together. And when you talk about that September 17th visit and the time difference, what are you referencing there? Uh, the temple records show when a member, um, I believe, scans a card and it tracks the date and time uh, to, to the second. And all the other, the previous and post uh, September 17th, they're all within a minute, two minutes, and sometimes seconds of each other, which is why we're saying that they're attending together. Uh, the September 20, the se September 17th, 2019, there was a 25 minute time difference. Uh, so I just wanted to caveat that to make it clear. And it was a 25 minute difference from when between Chad or Lori uh, scanning their card in? Correct. And the other <coughs> visits they scanned much closer in time together? Within seconds to two minutes probably on average. And looking at those first three dates, mm -hmm. was Charles still alive at that time? He was. And do you know when Charles was killed? On July 11th, 2019. And then looking at those next three dates in September, do you know if Tammy was still alive during that time? She was. And for that first visit on September 7th, do you know if Tylee was still alive? She was. And was JJ still alive? He was. And there's a note there indicating on September 8th or 9th, Tylee Ryan was killed. Uh, do you know the last time Tylee Ryan was seen alive? Uh, yes, she was the last, our last proof of life of Tylee was on September 8th, 2019, uh, based on photographs of her at, uh, in Yellowstone, found on one of Lori's iCloud accounts. So is that the presumptive date um, that, uh, regarding when she was maybe killed? Correct. I don't know the exact date or time. And uh, September 17th, was JJ still alive at that time? He was. Do you know the last time JJ was seen alive? Um, a fish, well, we know that there is a photo, a photograph of JJ saved in one of the Lori, one of Lori's iCloud accounts uh, the morning of September 22nd. And so when we have uh, September 22nd to 23rd, JJ Vallow killed, is that the presumptive date? Correct. And you would gather this information and then turn it over to other investigators, is that correct? Yes. And then there are, um, and then there is also the indication there of Tammy uh, being killed on October 18th or 19th. Do you know when she was pronounced dead? October 19th, 2019. And there are two things there in yellow regarding some attempted shootings. Um, did you learn that information through your investigation? I did. And so we have the October 2nd Brandon Boudreaux shooting. That was learned through the investigation? It was. And the October 9th attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell? Yes. And so while these events were occurring, um, there were temple visits in between. Is that correct? Yeah, there appeared to be, yes. 
If I may have just one moment, Your Honor. You may. I have no further questions at this time, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Mr. Thomas, cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. Good afternoon, Agent Heideman. Is it agent or special agent or? Uh, tactical specialist. I'm not, I'm not sworn. Tactical specialist. <laughs> yes. Okay. I know. It's a, a new one I've never heard before. Okay. Uh, and so tactical specialist, basically, uh, you've worked for the FBI for 15 years? Yes, sir. And you indicate that, uh, you just indicated you're a tactical specialist. Before that, I believe you said you were an evidence technician? Yes, sir. What's the difference? Uh, an evidence technician in, in the FBI, we were um, charged with maintaining custody and control of, evidence, of physical evidence brought into and out of the FBI. Okay. And now your job is to analyze? You're more of an analyst? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, let's just start with some of these uh, exhibits that the state has brought to your attention. Search activity of interest observed in Chad Daybell at Gmail. It's 184A. Can we have the 184A, please? <clears throat> yeah, just hand it to the witness. That's fine. Thank you. So you recognize this because you're the one that that drafted this, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the first one uh, is ind indicative of Chad Daybell at gmail.com saying, Ned Schneider, 1996, Death, Louisiana. I uh, have a different. Which, what do you have? Bit. It's uh, 184A, which was a two page PowerPoint. Okay. That's Are you on 184A? Yeah, 184A. Okay. And it's a it is a jump drive exhibit, so we've got courtesy copies in the jump drive. Can I? Uh, I wrote on mine, <laughs> so. Mr. Bailiff. There's a courtesy copy the witness can look at. If you want to publish it again, you can, Mr. Thomas, or you can just refer to the courtesy copy that's provided to the witness. All right. So, let, let's just let her. Uh, I'll just I'll just talk you through it if that's okay. Okay. So we're looking at uh, Ned Schneider, 1996, Death, Louisiana. You understand? Yes. Okay. And that you said that was significant to you. It was. And when you researched that, what did you find out about Ned Schneider in 1996? Uh, we just looked at the Google search history. Uh, that's, you mean research the, what, his, what he was searching? Right. We just, I just looked at the, the, the Google search history in, in these situations. You didn't look into what, it, what he was looking at? I did not, uh, no. Hmm. Is there any reason why you didn't do that? No, I suppose not. Okay. So what was so significant about Ned Schneider? Somebody told you that Ned Schneider, uh, 1996, Death, Louisiana, was something significant? Uh, the name Ned Schneider or Schneider was significant. The, the death dates or location was not quite as significant. You didn't, you didn't think that it was important to find out who this guy was? No. Okay. The next one, 131, 2019, Ned Schneider, Louisiana, obituary, 1997. Yes. You didn't look into that either? I did not. Uh, 
In fact, you didn't look into any of these? Uh, other than maybe the Rhode Island area code to confirm that 401? Uh, no. So your search was very narrow. Your, your task was very narrow just to find things within these search histories, because these search histories are huge, right? Yes. And your job was to find things that might match up to things that the state could use to prosecute. Is that right? Uh, potentially, yes. Okay. So you weren't, you weren't tasked with the job of actually finding out what any of these me meant or what significance that they drew. You were just tasked with finding names. That's it, right? Uh, with finding information that had already been presented in previous reporting or, or interviews, things that had already happened in the case that we were aware of, and then they appeared also in the search history. But you didn't, you didn't dig into them any further than that. It was just a cursory search. Correct, sir. Okay. And the same thing with lollyforever at gmail.com, the next part of the exhibit? Correct, sir. You mentioned, um, let's see, where am I at? Evidence of wedding planning. Uh, this was another exhibit. This was states 185. Can we have the? And we're done with 184. I. She can take that back. All right. And again, this was a PowerPoint that was admitted as an exhibit. So I do have a courtesy copy that you can use for reference. Oh, thanks, Judge. Witness, if you prefer. Thank you. You recall testifying about this particular exhibit? I do. And you made this this PowerPoint up? Yes. Okay. So on page two or the second page of this, uh, it talks about two documents discovered uh, during Lori for Style at iCloud.com, seven archangels and the presiding council of archangels. You you wrote that? Did I write it on the slide? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. And on the other side of the slide, you made reference to the Archangel Raphael and the fact that Tuesday was some sort of a significant day of the week. Mm -hmm. what, what was the significance of that? Uh, Chad and Lori were married on a Tuesday. And so you thought the fact that Chad and Lori were married on a Tuesday was a significant point because it said something about the Archangel Raphael on a Tuesday? I think the to it was uh, mostly of interest, the totality of the names and the Malachite and Tuesday uh, all in one. I think on on each on their own, probably not, but the totality of it was, of we thought, of importance. What other things happened on a Tuesday that were of significance? Nothing that I can think of. Did the kids die on a Tuesday? I don't remember. I'd have to look at the dates. Would it be I surprising if I told you they died on a Monday? Would that be surprising to you? No. Did uh, Tammy Daybell die on a Tuesday? I don't believe so. Would it be surprising if I told you she didn't? No. Okay. Um, were any of these searches that were done, were any of them done on a Tuesday? Uh, which searches, sir? Uh, any of the searches in 185, 184A, the ones that we talked about? I don't know. Didn't check? No. It wasn't that significant? Not in reference to the search sheets, no. The day of the week? Not no. not significant? It was not. Okay. Thank you. As far as the Malachite rings, um, these weren't special order rings, were they? Uh, I don't... I, in what respect? Well, they weren't, they weren't manufactured for the purpose of this particular couple. I don't know how they manufacture them. I think I believe the first, the first attempted purchase on August 14th was likely a special order because the manufacturer stated he was he did not have time to fulfill the order. 
So, um, but I can't speak to whether the other ones are custom made by uh, by the manufacturer or if it's a Etsy company, if it's just that individual. I don't know how custom they are. Okay. So you didn't really look into that? I did not know. Okay. So basically we have two Malachite rings. You don't know if they're special order or if they were uh, they were custom made, right? I do not know that, don't what we do know is that they were not the right size, correct. apparently, right? Uh, Chad's, correct, yes. Chad's was not the right size? Correct. Okay. So what size ring does Chad wear? Uh, based on the last purchase, I would assume a 10, but I can't say for certain what size ring he wears. So you don't know what size ring he wears? I do not. All right. And what about Lori? Do you know what size ring she wears? I don't know for certain, but based on the ring purchases, I believe they were a 4.5. Okay. So you don't know what size ring Lori wears? I do not. Do you know what size ring Alex Cox wears? I do not. Do you know what size ring Zulema Pastinez wears? No. Did you research any of that? No. Okay. Again, looking at States Exhibit 185, the evidence of the wedding planning. Um, let me just get you to the right page here. One, two. Page nine would be a text from Chad to Lori on 713. Okay. So you said you had some significance with that. Would you... Uh, argue with me if I told you that 713 was a Saturday? No. Was there any significance to that? No. The text message specifically says, concerning the two weeks, BYU-Idaho graduation is July 23rd. Would it surprise you if I told you that was a Tuesday? No. Was that a significant day? July 23rd, no. So the second to the last page, the request for Lori to have a beach wedding on 11-5-2019 on a Tuesday, it's kind of lost its significance a little bit, don't you think? I think with the totality of the previous stuff, on its own possibly, but showing the planning and their, uh, I guess, sort of belief of themselves in these different in these different names and the significance of Tuesday to their name and the significance of Malachite, I think totality, yes, as a standalone, not necessarily. Okay. Let's turn to the uh, to the temple records, Exhibit Two Thirty. Can we have that handed to the witness? Okay. And you can take back 185, please. The last three pages of Exhibit 230, uh, those are all of the dates and times that Lori Vallo and Chad Daybell had gone to the temple, is that correct? Uh, I don't actually have those pages, but I believe they were, yes. Well, let's get those pages. 2.30, uh, should look like this. These are the last three pages.
Do you have those last three pages? I do. Uh, and those are the actual attendance records of Lori Vallow and Chad Daybill for their Temple attendance. Is that right? Yes, sir. And do you see what day these Temple records start? It appears that uh, Lori Vallow's starts on October 5th, 2018. Okay. And right. Chad Daybell's start on October 10th, 2018. Okay. And when's the last day that they that they have records for? For Lori's, it is November 20th, 2019. And Chad's is November 20th, 2019. Okay. And... Um, Let's, in conjunction, I'd like you to also look at 185A. So I'd like her to have both of those at the same time, if that's okay. Thank you. So 185A is a chart that you... Uh, that, that yeah, you made up, right? Yes. Okay. And it shows that Chad and Lori had gone to the temple at approximately the same time on, looks like, seven different occasions. Is that right? Yes. And that would be during the time between all these records, right? Correct. Okay. Did you research uh, or find out or ask uh, about... Anyone else who also went to any of these temple trips with Chad and Lori? Uh, no, the records I were given just were for Chad and Lori. Okay. So you don't know if they went in a group? I do not. You don't know if they went um, w with each other or by themselves? They just showed up at the same time at the temple? Uh, yes. All right. Um, and as far as Chad and Lori's the temple attendance... This is but a fraction of the times that they had actually gone to the temple, right? Yes, sir. A very small fraction? Yes. Okay. So what is the significance between... 185A, which is your chart that indicates uh, when they went to the temple, when these people were allegedly killed, and uh, other significant events. What 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 is the tie-in? Uh, I believe that investigators, I don't say noticed a pattern, but saw that some of the temple visits occurred within a rel relatively short time frame to some of the uh, homicides. Mm. So the temple visit most closely to Charles Vallow's death was April 27th, right? Correct. Yes, sir. It's about three months away. Mm -hmm. Is that a significant time? That's up for interpretation, I suppose. Well, I'm asking you to interpret. You did the chart. Uh, yeah, uh, not not as significant as some of the others now. All right. Um, so you're saying basically the fact that uh, there was a temple attendance on September 7th would be significant because uh, Tyler Ryan was supposedly uh, killed on September the 8th. Correct. Is that your understanding? Yes. Okay. And that's what the significance was? Potentially. Potentially? Yes, I can't... Well, I, I guess what I'm asking is why would you make a chart to show this evidence if you don't believe in it? Objection, Your Honor. Counsel's testifying to misstating. I'll sustain that. So, another, okay. Ask another question. Sure. So you're saying that there's some significance between uh, Lori going to the temple and Chad going to the temple and the deaths of, of these people. I don't know that I can testify that. We're showing 
we're just putting it in relation, in time frame relation. What they did at the temple or spoke about, I can't speak to. I can speak to the records that we that I was presented and how they interact with the timeline of the investigation. And the way that you're portraying that is in a specific way of trying to show that these events and these temple visits were somehow connected. Your Honor, objection. I think this is ask and answered. And again, counsel's testifying. Uh, that I'll overrule that and ask that uh, the question be, that was a question that I'll ask the court reporter, if you would, to restate that last question, please, with the objection overruled. And the way that you're portraying that is specifically trying to show that these events were connected to the temple visits. Is that correct? I don't know that I can speak to that again. I'm, I'm portraying records and timelines. I can't say what the purpose of their visits were. So um, that's a no. Objection, Your Honor. I and mean, counsel's. That was a question. Well, counsel, it's it, argumentative. It is argumentative, so that's sustained. Let's move to exhibit number 186, and I'm done with 185A and whichever other one she has up there. Thank you. On 186, you indicate that uh, each Chad, Lori, and Alex uh, are attributable to having uh, three phones. You, 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 you say that those are significant. Is that right? Uh, they had more than three phones, but the three, they each had three during the relevant time frame that we thought were of importance. All right. And is it? Were of importance. I'm sorry. And is it out of the ordinary for somebody to have more than one phone number? No, sir. In fact, most people, if they have a business, they have a business phone and a personal phone, right? Correct. And maybe maybe an extra phone, right? Sure. Okay. There was, on Lori Vallow's phone numbers, there was a phone number associated with 808-755-5452. Yes. And you indicated on direct examination that this was subscribed to Premier Financial Services? Correct. Are you aware that Lori and Charles Vallow own that company together? I probably at some time. I don't remember that off the top of my head, no. So you didn't know that? Maybe initially, but it did not It did not come to me today. Okay. Uh, turning the page on Alex Cox's cell phone attributions, you indicated on two of the phone numbers, 304-960-5998 and 334-744-4204, that there were um, emails attached to the, or I'm sorry, not emails, yeah, Gmail, gmail.com emails, attached to those and that those were only effective uh well let's just start with the first one 304-960-5998 you indicate was a was a effective between 927 2019 and 1228 2019 is that right yes what do you mean by they were only effective during those dates that was the time frame provided by the um, provider as far as how long that phone number was uh, associated with um, this, this particular account. So how does that work? When somebody's phone number is attached to a, a, a Gmail account or, or another account? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. So you're saying that the provider told you that rehmaximus at gmail.com 
was only effective between 9-27-2019 and 12-28-2019. Oh, no, sir. The phone number 304-960-5998 was effective from September 27, 2019 through 12-28-2019. Um, RayMaximus at gmail.com was another identifier on that account. And so you're saying that the phone number was only active between 9-27-2019 and 12-28-2019? Yes, sir. Okay. That makes more sense. You talked a lot about um, some of the some of the searches that were done, and I'm trying to find that. So yeah, if I could just go back to 184A, if we could have the witness hand in that. Thank you. So if you look on the second page, the summary regarding lolly for time uh, lolly time forever at gmail um on 7 2019 talks about gerber life policy and then there's a semicolon um was that all one what, what you you put a lot of things in quotes and then there's several things attached to each one were they separate uh and distinct searches or were they all one search uh, they were separate searches, or it was a um, it was a search, and then it would be a visit. So there was a visit to a site, or it could be multiple searches. Okay, so when you say a visit to a site, that's when you type something in, you click on it, and then other things come up, pop up in the background. Correct. And they lead you to that particular site. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, and can you differentiate? Which one was which on these uh, on this particular exhibit? Uh, on this exhibit, no. How would you be able to do that? I believe my I have a full report that shows which I'll have to double check which sites were visits and which were just searches. Okay. And where is that report? It's in, I don't know if it's in evidence or not. So there's no way for you to tell us today whether or not these were searches or whether they were visits? Each individual one, no, but they appeared in the search history. That's what I can testify to. They appeared in the search history on that particular day? Correct. So they could have happened any time during a 24-hour period? Correct. I didn't get into the minutes, no. Okay. So um, the next one down, 7-26-2019. Phoenix Pet Services, Craigslist, Cell Service Dog. You didn't research into or ask any questions about what what that was specifically about? Uh, I did not. However, my job is more to provide leads to investigators, and I know that those leads were ran out by other people, but not by myself, no. Okay. If I could have just a second, Judge. You may.
Governor, we're done with this witness. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect? Just briefly, Your Honor. Go ahead, Ms. Blake. Ms. Heideman, with regard to the Google searches, were you tasked with just looking at what was searched? Yes. And were you looking for information that appeared relevant to the investigation? Yes. And when you found that information, did you pass it on to other law enforcement officials? I did. And when you first began that search, had the children's bodies been located? At the time I first reviewed it, no, it was still a missing persons investigation. So specifically on that wind search, did that initially uh, appear relevant to you? Uh, no, not at first. When did that appear uh, relevant? Uh, after the children's bodies were recovered. And was that based on the location? Uh, of their... Of their remains? Yes. You were asked if it would surprise you that the kids died on a Monday. Correct. Do you recall that question? I do. If I told you that September 8th was a Sunday and September 9th was a Monday, would that surprise you? It would not. Of 2019? It would not. And if I told you that September 22nd was a Sunday and September 23rd was a Monday in 2019, would that surprise you? It would not. With regard to the temple visits, were you looking for times that Chad and Lori were at the temple together? I was. You were not looking at times that they went separately? No. Was November 5th of 2019 a significant day? Yes. And what day of the week was that? A Tuesday. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. I don't see any uh, need for redirect after that or recross. I'm sorry, Mr. Thomas. Oh, so no, with that, that will conclude the testimony of this witness.